thank you. And thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. Um, I really do appreciate it. You all have this great weather. I left all that snow to come to Houston. <laughs> and uh, I've been telling people back home it's like 70 degrees, or it feels like 70 degrees. So um, I'm, I'm happy and delighted. Um, I also want to obviously thank uh, the sponsors of, of this series, and in particular, um, Professor Romero, who, uh, as he said, we've been talking for the last several years. and. It was a pleasure to finally meet him. Also to uh, Wes, I don't know if he's here this evening, but um, Professor uh, Dr. Wesley Jackson for all his administrative support, um, and to Monica Pereras. And uh, to the folks who joined me this afternoon, it was a, a really good conversation around uh, food studies. I learned a lot. So for the next um, several moments, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a chapter from my uh, next book, which is on food policing and food shaming in black communities. And I want to talk about, uh, in specifics, uh, issues of displacement and dislocation. And so I'm going to uh, talk just a little bit and then leave some time, of course, for, for questions. Okay, so you might be wondering about the title of today's discussion, In Her Mouth Was an Olive Leaf Plucked Off. I came to this topic in uh, 2012 while thinking a lot about this book that I'm working on, but also about the changing dynamics that are going on in the world right now with regard to food. Um, there's probably nothing we can see or turn on or hear that doesn't involve in some way, shape, or form eating, eating right, eating clean, eating well, and so forth. So I put this title forward while thinking also about, the about those issues of food studies, but also about the survivors of Hurricane Katrina, um, who Professor Rick Mizell reminded me, many in this generation, don't know or remember Katrina because they were too young, right? So I'm thinking about folks who are displaced and dislocated and the ways that they might uh, think and feel when they experience being told what to eat, how to eat, and or have their foods policed because they don't obey. For the last several years, or at least since uh, I wrote Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs, as I traveled throughout the U.S., and I was explaining this this afternoon, from one end of the country to the other, I have often heard men and women tell stories about how they were being told that the foods that they found comfort in and the foods that they desired and relished were unhealthy, unclean, and even harmful. More and more I began to question what's going on in this cultural moment when populations of people are feeling that their life ways are being uh, are deemed wrong and inappropriate. And I begin to wonder and theorize about how this affects one's psyche, if you will, especially when you're starting over after trauma. As today's version of the food movement gathers theme, as it shapes and influences the minds of many, I'm noticing that there is a lot of moralizing going on. There's a lot of righteous soapboxing taking place. There's a farmer's market or a bumper sticker or a recyclable bag advocating buy local and other mantras. Everyone, from pundits to journalists, food scholars to enthusiasts, foodies, everyone seems to have some expertise on what is deemed fresh, healthy, and wholesome food. We are, in my, to my way of thinking, in the middle of a food hysteria, quite frankly. Eating is no longer just about enjoying your food, but also assigning a label. It has to be organic, sustainable, healthy, clean, local, what have you. And at the heart of what seems to be this culinary madness is an attitude of moral certitude that one person, group, or groups knows better than another about what they should be eating. Now, I'm fully OK if you all don't give me nods and, and, and so forth. I gave a similar talk in San Francisco, and they were so mad with me when I left there. And I'm all right with that. I'm fully, I'm te you all are my test audience. So when this book comes out, I know that people are going to be like, I don't want to hear this. But it's true, because 
we, we, you know, this is an emotion that we're talking about. Now I'll get to this more in a bit. Um, so it also seems that a failure to adhere to this set of prescriptives often results in food shaming and food policing. So my book, whose title, quite frankly, seems to change every day, uh, right now stands at being titled um, Eating While Black, Food Shaming and Food Policing in African American Communities. It's centrally concerned with how the current changing food world affects and is affected by African American people. While my primary focus is African Americans because that's my life experience, immigration by those who deem themselves black in US context also will have some place in this discussion. In particular, what I'm concerned about is the constant, as I said, policing and controlling of black bodies in the context of food. This is, of course, not a phenomenon experienced only by African American people, but my discussion aims to center black people as a case study from which to explore these dynamics. So then this discussion today, tonight, also centers black bodies because our relationships to food are and continue to be vexed and very much maligned. Beyond the association of African American people with soul food, or that arrangement of foods eaten and enjoyed by many well beyond the South, our food cultures are rooted in continued misinformation. Despite the efflorescing scholarship on African Americans in food, the belief still persists that African American food culture came from scraps. So then the earliest examples of mass displacement among humans can be traced to the great flood as described in the Bible. When focusing on African Americans specifically, we can begin by looking, oh, I think my PowerPoint got, okay. We can begin by looking uh, here, and this is where this uh, particular title comes from, right? Genesis 8, 8 and 11, when Noah sent the dove out to see if he could find any dry land, the water was still too high, so it returned to the ark and Noah held out his hand and drew the dove, the dove back inside. Seven days later, Noah released the dove again. This time it returned to him with a fresh olive leaf in its beak and that's how he knew the water was gone. So let me just share with you all something right now. So I'm the daughter of a Baptist preacher, preacher and a teacher. So when I ask a question, I'm going to be expecting a response, right? Because in my dad's church, it's a call and response. So he says, can I get an amen? And the church says, amen. ah, love it. So if I say, do you understand what I'm saying? Then my expectation is that you will either say yes or no. Yeah? Right? OK, so this is an interactive kind of thing. I'm not here to just talk at you. I'm here to talk with you. So good, we're, we're, we're on and, and rolling. So when we focus on African Americans specifically, we can begin by looking at the concept of the diaspora. I don't know why. I can't tell what the next slide is. Sorry. Um, the, we begin the process of learning how identity is constructed, and more importantly to this topic, the role of food in the process of placemaking. If you know anything at all about diaspora, most of the time it refers to African or Jewish cultures. Uh, diasporas are not always voluntarily uh, voluntary. Sometimes they are prompted by forced removal, uh, by trade, through conquests and genocides. For example, in today's global economy, part of what complicates the term diaspora and I thinking about it has to do with politics, economics, cyber technology, transhuman flows, and lived experience. For this talk, I tend to draw on the definition by Jaina Brazel and Anita Manure who say that uh, diaspora define it as historically referred to displaced communities of people who have been displaced from their native homeland through the movements of migration, immigration, or exile. Bringing us where we are today, the authors maintain that groups of displaced persons and communities move across the globe. They say that diaspora is a catch-all phrase to speak of, of all or for all movements. Therefore, they urge us to exercise some caution in using the term, because not all travel is diaspora. Some forms of travel are tourism and leisure, right? So to mark all forms of movement as disenfranchising can render the power of the term as null and void. 
So today, what I'm presenting you with is, and I'm not sure why, it looks like my, I'm not sure if my slides are, are moving forward. Okay, so I ask then that you consider uh, these uh, couple of questions. Uh, one, how do we define, how we define home becomes essential to our understanding of the self. One of the questions is how have definitions of home and identity been affected by dislocations and uh, transitions? I also ask what are the ways in which communities use food to reflect and reproduce systems of identities, relationships and values using food, especially during times of dislocation? And I ask all of this in the context of if we look back and if this is essential for establishing community, what happens when one cannot or does not want to look back? Or when future generations do not know how to look back and have been taught differently? And lastly, if looking back means looking within the US for your displacement, what too does that mean? Using three primary examples taken from African American experiences, enslavement, the Great Migration, and Hurricane Katrina, I hope to provide some avenues for thinking more critically about these questions. As I mentioned earlier, I teach a course titled Food Trauma Sustainability. The, cor the course works from the general premise that food acquisition, preparation, and consumption is deeply embedded in cultural practice. While we tend to mostly see environmental as uh, the primary discipline for studying sustainability, I urge us to take a look at cultural sustainability. At the bottom line, this course asks, how does food enable us to achieve a more satisfactorily intellectual, emotional, moral, and spiritual existence. That's the definition of cultural sustainability. And then how do we do this in times of transition and migration, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, but especially during times of displacement and dislocation? I always begin this course with, okay, this is one of those. Can you see that okay? I always begin this course with uh, two key texts. One is from the Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie, um, who uh, authored the book Purple Hibiscus, and, and she wrote some others. But she has a TED talk that I urge you to take a look at called The Danger of the Single Story. And she says the single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. Okay, that's fine. She said, when you show people as one thing over and over again, and that's what they become. In this talk, she also warns that the risk, we risk a very critical and cultural misunderstanding when we forget that everyone's lives and identities are composed of many overlapping stories. And I want to emphasize that. When we only hone in on one story, we totally miss the larger point of people. Right? So we're all composed and comprised of overlapping stories. Again, when we focus on the single story, it creates a stereotype. So I start this with my, my students. I, I start with that. And then I share with them another, um, another quote. And this is taken from Kai Erickson. And he's talking, speaking about trauma. And he says that trauma can be an issue from sustained exposure to battle, as well as from a moment of numbing shock from a continuing pattern of abuse, as well as from a single searing assault, from a period of severe at, uh, attenuation and erosion, as well as from a sudden flash of fear. The effects are the same, and that, after all, should be our focus. So these are the two places that I start when I'm talking with my students about food trauma and sustainability. So then I move on from there to start, for me, with slavery and emancipation. And of course, uh, I have here an image of the transatlantic slave trade so that you can see the myriad ways in which people, millions of people's lives uh, were affected. Because most African people entered the New World through the horrific mouth of slavery, it's a natural starting point, actually, for considering African-American relationships to food and a development of group consciousness. The institution of slavery and its human consequence is central to understanding every other historical event in African-American history, including emancipation, reconstruction, the civil rights movement, 
And all of this is embedded within our food cultures. Can you all see this okay? Okay, great. From near starvation to relative abundance, the food practices of early African American, Africans and Caribbean people in America necessarily influences what we today know as soul food. Creole soul, Gullah foodways, and the like. The foodways of these early generations have obviously morphed and changed as a result of location, relocation, admixing, and acclimation. But it's because of the factors uh, that African American food habits cannot be, because of these factors, we cannot consider African American food habits in a singular form. The literature on African American food waste during dis enslavement is vast, and I won't review it here, except to emphasize that what emerges are two important variables that I think we cannot overlook, adaptation and creativity. During the Middle Passage, when African Americans, uh, when Africans were taken from their homelands, exchanged for goods and sold into slavery, many captured people experienced starvation, vitamin deficiencies, and even death. Given the trauma of their experiences, many arrived at their destinations malnourished if they survived at all. They would thus have to adjust to their new surroundings, including the foods available to them. But what we should know is that Africans came to this new world with many new foods. No, they didn't pick them up as they were being captured and store them anywhere, because these are some of the myths. No, they didn't stop and grab seeds or anything. But when you think about it, the slave, uh, uh, slavers uh, needed to be able to feed their captives, right? And so what do you feed these captives but the foods that they are familiar with? African yam, for example, I don't know if you, can you just dim the lights for just a minute? I'm not sure if you can see the African yam, which is very different, of course, from our sweet potatoes, um, right? It's a tuber. They also fed plantain, um, if that was available, malaguata peppers. All of these then become foods that were brought to the New World um, uh, with uh, African captives. Malaguata peppers there, pigeon peas, watermelon, uh, and so forth. Okay, you can bring the lights back up. Historian Robert Hall tells us, for example, that foods like yams were part of the link between diet and captive labor forces that formed the Americas as well as other countries. And things like peppers, uh, sesame seeds, and so forth were used in order to uh, uh, spice up or season some of the foods that had gone bad uh, during the journey. So all of these foods then came to the US, and in fact, Many Europeans, once those foods arrived and once the captives arrived, many Europeans would have starved were it not for some of these new foods because Europeans weren't necessarily familiar with and adapted to the climate um, of the Americas. And so therefore, many of these foods were able to survive uh, in the New World. And so between Native peoples and African, Ameri African peoples, uh, all of this then helped uh, all three of these cultures actually to survive. And yet entry in the new world economy bore witness to foods being highly regulated, carefully watched, and minimally dispersed. So in other words, African American and African food waste have been policed from the moments we left African shores. So food policing and food shaming is not new to African American communities. Early colonists, as I said, would have starved in many instances were it not for the interventions of Africans and Native Americans. But this kind of regulation meant new ways of acquiring enough food to survive. The lack of familiar surroundings, the ingredients and the utensils with which to cook and eat also meant that African traditions had to merge with those natives to the, uh, with those who were native or indigenous to the New World and also the colonial settlers who were occupying the lands. In short, the experiences of slavery fractured the culinary experiences of African diasporic people, all of whom hailed from different ethnic communities in their native countries. In the wake of slavery, however, new enclaves and ethnic identities were created and new struggles and ways of surviving uh, took place. So I think that my PowerPoint has stopped working, so I'm just going to... Um, is it coming? Oh, no, I had to restart it. I could restart it. If you just bear with for a moment while that's going on. So the kind of culinary 
uh, inventiveness, this kind of culinary inventiveness is a central aspect of our culinary heritage. It still hasn't come back because it's here on my screen. Okay, there we go. I think we left it on too long while we were waiting. That's okay. All right, so we might want to just a little bit dim the lights. So this kind of culinary inventiveness is a central aspect of our culinary heritage, from the African imprint left on the foodways of the New World to the creative means of acquiring, producing, and distributing food. African American food waste has never been as simple as cooking and consuming pork scraps. Rather, for African American women and men, food waste were a major vehicle for the expression of culture and identity, due in no small part to the ways in which foods were stretched, augmented, made tasty and sustaining while, filling, uh, while being filled with ritual and tradition. And of course, I should note here that African Americans also were able to take, when possible, some foods um, and market them, as you see here, um, in, particularly as I've written about previously, chickens and other foodstuffs, um, and were able to sometimes uh, use these processes to buy their freedom. Uh, here's a woman who was sketched at a Richmond train station selling chicken and rolls. Uh, here's a huckster, uh, one of my favorite uh, images. Uh, she's adorned uh, with a basket of vegetables and one on each arm. There are whole traditions that go along with huckstering and hawking. All of this is part of the African American food tradition, much of which we don't hear anything about. These are the Gordonsville, Virginia waiter carriers who built houses and put their children through school and did other ingenious uh, things in their lives and in the lives of generations uh, to come uh, by selling foodstuffs at the trains, uh, meeting the trains with hot coffee and, and pie and things of that nature. And the numerous questions that we could ask about that process um, are, are, are endless. So from uh, the moment, uh, so far from being homogeneous, the shared history that African Americans have is as much as embraced as it is disavowed. And food often factors as a contested symbol at the center of these interracial and cultural debates. From the moment that African people reached these shores well into the period of the Great Migration until the early uh, Civil Rights Movement, African American people had to measure their freedom of movement and their consumption by someone else's authority, even in an uh, emancipation. And I have here, of course, Juneteenth, which uh, being in Texas, you might be familiar with. According to the Texas State History Association entry on Juneteenth, on June 19, 1865, Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston and issued the General Order No. 3, which read in part, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. And of course, we know these great tidings brought words of freedom. It reached the approximately 250,000 slaves in Texas gradually. Some immediately, others as long as a year, and still others as long as six to eight years. Not surprisingly, as individual uh, plantation owners were reluctant to suddenly release the power and control over their labor force, so they simply didn't tell them that they were free. Once news reached critical masses, however, we began to see celebrations of Juneteenth. The first celebrations were usually political rallies and affairs, um, teaching African Americans about voting, but within more time, you began to see actual celebrations take place. But I want to give pause in that whole notion of celebration, because of course, when we think of Juneteenth, most of us tend to think of uh, celebrations, dancing and shouting. But I want you to think for just one moment. You've been enslaved all your natural life. You are now 80 years old, or you're 30 years old, or you're 50 years old, you're 10 years old, you don't even know what to think. Even as people celebrated, some even immediately claimed their freedom by plundering and appropriating objects from those who for so long held them in bondage. I would venture to guess that many more cried and wondered about this new life. All of a sudden, you're free. 
There was no doubt in the biblical parlance much weeping and gnashing of teeth. In remembering her life in bondage, Minerva Bendy, a former slave in Woodville, Texas, recalls that at first she was upset by the notion of freedom. She said she was just turned out with no food, no nothing. And there were no doubt many who were in shock and in awe. Mothers were both happy for their children and fearful for their children. What would they eat now that they were free? How would they acquire food? What land did they have to grow crops? What money did they have to buy provisions? You see, I'm urging us to think more about the complicated nature of food and not just always just take the story that we've been given, jubilee, everybody's happy. No, some people just were like miserable. They didn't know what they were going to do. I did a talk uh, last year and someone said, what do you think people ate when they found out they were free? I'm like, I don't think they ate anything. I think they were miserable, quite frankly, because they didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. Who thinks about chicken and collard greens and macaroni? But that's the story that we are given, and I'm urging us to think a little differently about that. Now, some were given provisions. Um, One ex-slave said that um, she and others were given a cow or a mule if they left and hire for wages if they stayed. But others were threatened with the knowledge that they would starve on their own with no master to spare them. So the fact that black people ate is undoubtedly, they did eat. But because of the relative unimportance assigned to food in academic circles, this aspect of black people's experiences has been left unexplored. But yet food does have meaning in migration. When we think about, for example, this image that comes from the uh, now uh, taken down uh, installation that was at the Smithsonian's Museum of African American, of uh, American history, Um, the uh, installation was called From Field to Factory. When we think about this and we think about it through the lens of food, then all kinds of stories emerged about the ways in which African American people would pack a shoebox lunch well into the 30s or 40s with foods like chicken because they travel well. Even today, when folks go on a bus trip, generally they're going to take a food that will last, right? Not something that will spoil, um, but they will take something like chicken. There's lore, folklore, that says you would know uh, the path that African Americans took on a bus or a train because you would follow the trail of chicken bones, and that was called the Chicken Bone Express. So black people did eat. Black people did uh, carry uh, things like uh, chicken on their trip. In this installation, which was part of Field to Factory, there was uh, the little girl that's there on the train had a little note pinned to her uh, telling the uh, porter where she was going. And in the original piece, she had a little pail that had her lunch there. Um, And it would most likely have, again, chicken and uh, some kind of sweet or some kind of fruit. So folks would acquire food in that way. There are also stories of post-emancipation where people dug through garbage cans, foraged in woods, or sought work wherever they could or ultimately turned to the almhouse. Women engaged in domestic work and took full advantage of what is called the pan, that is the leftovers that were left by their employers. When permitted, uh, they were able to take those foods home. So there are a range of stories of how African American people acquired food. There's also the range of stories about freed women working um, to help their husbands and children helping their fathers to plant, cultivate, and harvest crops. But this was laborious and time uh, in, um, uh, uh, consuming work. And so many of these women sought to get out of the field post-slavery and also post-reconstruction. They no longer wanted to be working a garden or in the fields. So if that is the historical narrative of truth, of fact, when people say to us today, you should just grow your own food, You can understand for some people why that is relatively problematic, because the history of food acquisition and production in at least African American communities is fraught with challenge. It is one of cooking by the side of the road because you could not um, go to a hotel because of black codes and Jim Crow laws. It's also one of the agricultural school of Booker T. Washington trying to teach people various agricultural principles. 
It's also one of uh, black women reformers helping others in their transitions. The stories are vast and wide. It's funny because most of us do not know this history, unfortunately, or this heritage, nor do we think through the implications that it has on generations of people. Rather, we just want people to grow their own food. And I ran into this situation when I was giving a talk out in the Midwest. A woman came up to me and she said, you know, you gave, you gave a great talk, but you missed one important point. And I said, oh, what is that? And she said, <laughs> In my estimation, growing one's own food is just like heaven on earth. And I said, wow, great. In your estimation and in your opinion and in your experience. And I sought to gently clarify for her that producing one's own food is not always a welcome task for all groups of people. I went on to share with her what Jeff Rahm nicely says. Land was given away free to whites at the same time that Reconstruction failed in the South. Native lands were appropriated and natives exterminated. The Chinese and Japanese precluded from land ownership and the Californios were disenfranchised of their ranches, according to how it's quoted in Julie Guthman's work. So one of the key problems with this way of thinking is that an agrarian imaginary still persists in the US as much as, as you have much white land ownership work mostly even today by non-white labor. It is not that people of color don't care about our health or don't care about growing our own food. Rather, many communities have completely different historical and cultural ideologies about gardens. Kyle Wilkinson's study of Hunt County indicates that at the end of the 19th century, for example, as families became enmeshed in tenancy and sharecropping, they had to concentrate on cash crops, cotton. So gardening fell by the wayside. Some women were able to grow vegetables, but many more were concentrating on their life ways. So then we fast forward to a contemporary example, Hurricane Katrina. Though African Americans have migrated forcibly and voluntarily throughout history, the first great migration of African Americans is said to have taken place roughly from 1910 to 1930. And during this time, approximately six million African Americans left the South and moved northward and westward, and some actually moved farther south to Waco, for example, here in Texas. People left in droves, and they took with them their food waves. This brief account serves to emphasize the point that as people moved, they took their life ways with them. As a deeply embedded aspect of one's life, food ways generally are resistant to change. It's one of the last things that you will give up. You may change your clothing, you may change your language, you may change any, your hair, anything, but one of the last vestiges of your life ways tends to be food. A recent example of this phenomenon took place during Hurricane Katrina when the largest displacement of Americans since the Civil War reverberated across the country from its starting point in New Orleans. More than half a million people were uprooted by the hurricane and they sought shelter, sustenance, and the semblance of new lives. At the center of this likeness is food, an area of focus that seems all but overlooked unless from a standpoint of hunger and scarcity, because of course we know the images were rampant of those who were trying to acquire food. So those of you who don't remember or know Hurricane Katrina, this is what some of that looked like, and I'm sure some of your professors, I know uh, Professor Mazel has taught this, you can see how far uh, the water was. And so then there was this image of the looters and the finders, right? which sparked a great deal of debate throughout uh, the, the tensest moments of uh, the hurricane. The young man up at the top, this image, these images were released by the AP and he was said to have been looting uh, from a grocery store and then the two residents at the bottom uh, were wading through the water finding bread and soda. Again, there's the single story. All African Americans have a disposition toward theft. What people have since found out is the young woman below is actually a Latina woman, um, and so it's not as clear as what appears on the screen as black and white. 
So the point here is to emphasize that um, these displaced peoples from the storm uh, poured into cities from coast to coast, crowding sports arenas, convention centers, schools, churches, and homes of friends, relatives, and even strangers. Hundreds of miles from New Orleans, hotels were jammed to capacity. Rich and poor alike, they found themselves starting over. The former buying new houses and other goods, leasing new office space, and picking up to some extent where they left off. The latter, people who were without transportation or able to leave the city, perhaps waited in lines for bars of soap, bottles of water, or a peanut butter sandwich. Katrina scattered and unmoored people in a few hours and days than many other major natural disasters. Estimating from census data, about 150 of the displaced lived below the poverty line even before they lost everything. Far more than 50,000 of them are past retirement age. Despite the shelters that were offered, many refused the protections, still reeling from the reality of their new situation. One displaced person, Latrice Alexander, gave an inter interview where she indicated, and I'm quoting, when my family first came here, I was like, no way. I'm not staying at a shelter. I'm not going in. I sat in the parking lot for like an hour and refused to come in. And now this place is basically home, end quote. The stories involving how people negotiated shelter go hand in hand with how they located food. Amidst the conversations of destroyed fishing boats and food stamp acquisitions is a conversation about missing familiar foods and tastes that remind one of home. One evacuee, Tasha Thomas Naquin, is quoted in the New York Times Tribune as saying, and I'm quoting, early after Hurricane Katrina, getting that taste of New Orleans required a little ingenuity and driving. When I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, patent sausage was one of the things I missed most, and the DD smoked sausage, especially when I wanted to make gumbo, she says. I would take the 10-hour ride all the way back home with my cooler in the back of my van and stock up on all my New Orleans foods I couldn't get in North Carolina. Blue crabs, DD smoked sausage, patent hot sausage, alligator sausage, and Louisiana seafood. If it wasn't for a little taste of home during those times, I think I would have lost my mind. That food really brought me comfort." End quote. Her willingness to drive 10 hours or more with her igloo cooler speaks to her need, people, to stabilize her life with foods that are familiar and comforting, but also for those that define her identity. Not only does food create a bond among community members despite their being apart, but it links people across space and time. More than simply personal choice or objects of emotion, foods that provide a sense of security are deeply embedded within larger social and cultural systems. Now, I know y'all may not have had a chance to eat, so these next photographs, <laughs> I'm sorry in advance because I got hungry looking at them, but um, many of these will uh, maybe be familiar. They're from a uh, Washington Post um, article uh, that I came across. Houston witnessed its own influx of displaced people. As one of the largest port cities, it has long welcomed those seeking new ways of life after the Vietnam War and even earlier, and then throughout time, and then again in the context of Katrina. In a Washington Post article contributed to by your own Professor Romero, we are told, and I'm quoting him, if LA and New Orleans had a baby, it might be Houston. End quote. Speaking to the influx and admixing of cultures, the essay goes on to speak to the conflation and creativity of food cultures between whites, Hispanics, African Americans, and Asians. And again, I'm getting that from the article. Asian Cajun and Asian soul, as the food is referred to in the article, bespeaks the creative cooking and innovative restaurants that have sprung up of late. But I'm more interested in a point that was made by one of the chefs, the creator of Asian Cajun, which you see here. In the video accompanying the November 10, 2015 article, John Wen, owner of Cajun Kitchen, says, and I'm quoting him, after Katrina, 2004 and 2005, we just really took off. We got a lot of Vietnamese people who came here and just a lot of people from Louisiana coming to Houston. And they were looking for a lot of things to eat, and that just really, re that just really reminded them of home. 
What Chef Yuen observes is not new. This observation has long been acknowledged because people, uh, because foods that pot, foods tie people to place and space. The Red Apple Market, for example, located at the intersection of New Hampshire Avenue and University Boulevard in Langley Park, Maryland, has been a neighborhood institution for over 20 years. As one of the oldest ethnic grocery stores in the area, it has spent decades providing, quote, a taste of home to mainly Caribbean and African immigrants, and now more recently to Latinas and Asians. Not only do these ethnic markets serve as multilingual transnational hubs for the exchange of goods, service, and capital, but also they are key to the ways in which many immigrants preserve their cultural lifeways. Of equal importance, these culinary landscapes highlight the importance of cultural sustainability. This last quote was in a March 2007 article called Knowing What It Means to Miss New Orleans. Kim Severson writes, and this is a pretty long quote, but I'm going to share it. So longing for some connection to New Orleans, I head to the No-No Kitchen in Park Slope, Brooklyn. The chef, Greg Tadis, has cooked for Paul Prudhomme in K. Paul's Louisiana Kitchen and slung gumbo at the Delta Grill and so forth and so on. As we worked our way through a po' boy and some shrimp remoulade, a bowl of duck gumbo and oysters, I was lonelier for New Orleans than ever. The place sure had the warm, comfortable feel of New Orleans, but the bread on the po' boy just couldn't match the thin, airy loaves with the crackling crust made by Liedenheimer's Bakery. The shrimp lacked the character of the good, wild Gulf shrimp, and the big, brash Gulf oysters from Louisiana weren't invited to the party. I've quoted her at length because she raises important questions. Why are some foods more translatable than others? And even more, how does translatability affect one's ability to feel at home? Because taste is often tied to place and belonging, homesickness and preference too come into play. So it's really interesting to me when chefs move into neighborhoods, not, I'm sure that this is the case in Houston, but in some places, and all of a sudden they become southern or they become something else and they start making fusion cuisine and other kinds of cuisines and therefore they become the chef of note. But then again, that might actually be another paper. So years after the storm, the Washington Post revisited more than a dozen flooded out Louisianans who were first interviewed shortly after they arrived in DC. Although several said they had settled into fairly comfortable routines, many of them continued to live for the short term, unable to talk assuredly about the future. They thought they would be going back. Many, though homesick, had found jobs. Some had settled in. Their loved ones were in other areas. Some did return to the South. One displaced resident admitted to turning to food as a source of relocating herself and her sense of home. She said, and I'm quoting, and I'm also ending. She said, I spend my days doing what I've liked to do for most of my days, get in the kitchen and cook. And, that's, and then the article goes on to cite her specialties chicken and sausage gumbo, cream cheese pie, red beans and rice, shrimp fettuccine, and a quote, a lot of crawfish if I can find where to buy it up here. So this notion of being able to, of being displaced, but then being able to find one's own food that speaks directly to one's identity is very, very important. The cultural dimensions of a people's experiences during displacement has generally been largely neglected, but there is obvious evidence that suggests the relationships between place and the social and ritual activities that are performed there. And of particular importance for this discussion is the social, cultural, and ritual performances with food. What I'm advocating for then to return to how I started is food freedom. I think we need a redefinition of the food stories that define our cultures. We can begin to see the importance of not demonizing and degrading the foods that help to create and sustain our communities and other people's communities, rather than labeling them the byproduct of this consumption, or rather than labeling this consumption as an epidemic. A more fruitful and lasting paradigm, it seems, may be to help communities incorporate more helpful preparation techniques and ingredients. What I'm also advocating for is the freedom to choose what tastes good and what is good for us, and what is good for our personal economics. 
In a more vehement argument, Jason Lusk writes, and I'm quoting, the debate is nasty because freedom is at stake. On one side are farmers who want to work and consumers who want to eat as they please. On the other side are the self-proclaimed saviors of the food system who want to make decisions for us. The food elite have appointed themselves our caretakers. They seek the power to steer food production and choice, claiming to know better than farmers and consumers. It's time we regain control of our forks and farms and rightly consume, assume responsibility for our own health, environment, and pocketbooks. I'm advocating for doing away with the moral certitude that your or anyone else's definition of eating healthy is somehow better than mine. Yet when given the chance or the fancy, one will travel into the hinterlands to go exotic and eat macaroni and cheese, fried chicken, and collard greens. This is not to say that all foods are cooked healthily. Of course not. Often we wouldn't eat them if they were. Rather, my point is that many of us have brought wholesale lock, stock, and barrel into the misleading single story picture of food and agriculture that we are constantly fed by those who seek to regulate what we eat. Lusk would argue, and I'm quoting, the food police rely on a distorted view of reality to gain support for a sweeping agenda that if successful will actually cause more harm than good. So maybe we need to reframe the question and not ask why people won't participate in healthy eating, but question our desire to enroll people in a particular set of food practices. As philosopher Lisa, Lisa Helke maintains, and I'm quoting, paper or plastic thinking begins by constructing our ethical choices as a dichotomy. Do this or do that. Would-be ethical food consumers approach every alternative food campaign as a kind of moral, social, ecological litmus test. To be a good person, you must eat vegetarian, eat vegan, eat organic, eat local, eat biodynamic, eat fair trade, eat authentic, eat. She says, I applaud these individual efforts to challenge the industrial agri-food system. I do not applaud their tendency to reduce moral life to a set of rigid choices that, if correct, can somehow make me good. Shaming is a painful emotion caused by consciousness of guilt, shortcoming, or impropriety. No one likes to be wrong or to feel like they have a shortcoming, and no one likes to feel like their knowledge of anything is subordinate to anyone else. But the fact of the matter is we must stop people, stop allowing others to make us, African Americans but other cultures as well, feel ashamed of our cultural food. Rightly or wrongly, we adopted these food habits and we have enjoyed them for centuries. We need to be very clear, in, for those of us who do food work, that food is about choice. Conceptualizing food choice is a complex process, according to Fust et al., with a range of influences and values that are negotiated differently by diverse people in a variety of settings. Recognizing this, they say, will help all of us be more holistic in our view of food practices and efforts to improve our own dietary behaviors. If, in fact, our goal is really to improve the life ways of people and assist in ensuring access, it seems we also need to consider heavily people's life courses and the decisions, options, values, and desires that are best for them. It seems we should stop trying to force people to live under the burden of a perceived disobedience that constantly casts them into a space of shame. If, in fact, we are truly food advocates, then I think we should be about the business of social justice and not cultural policing. To me, it seems this is the most humane solution. Thank you. Okay, so should I entertain questions? Sure. Jump right out there. I see you in the back row. You had your hand up in the red shirt. Were you going to ask a question?
Oh, why did I choose food? Um, okay, well, because I actually um, am interested in people and how we relate to objects in general, clothing, um, uh, the things that we have in our homes, the material world. Food happened to be uh, one of the areas that I was studying early in graduate school. And um, I, I didn't have any idea that I would continue to be talking about this, but as time has gone on, and again, I've seen these shifts, and I'm seeing, uh, as I mentioned, um, some very interesting things happening in our current discourses around food that I think need to be brought to the, to the floor and to the table. So um, I didn't necessarily choose this. I think it more or less chose me. Um, but I'm going to run with it and, and, and you know, try to, again, uh, do the work of, of activism. I come from an activist background. And so this is my, the work that I tru, uh, try to do in communities. Um, this is my way of, of working in food liberation and activism. Yes, sir? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, in the new, I do that somewhat in the, in the book that's out now, The Building Houses, but I'm gonna do it more in the new book um, because, you know, I know that we as, as a culture of people like the phrase, um, making a way out of no way, and we did. We absolutely did. But what I try to uh, point out is that slavery was a very complex system, and for example, you had a lot of Muslims who came uh, through the slave trade and who, did, who continued to try and practice Islam. And they did not eat pork. Um, African American people um, foraged, they were in the woods, they learned, they knew berries, they knew medicinals, they knew herbs. Um, and they, uh, there's a range of things that people ate. You snake, squirrel, rat, Beaver, I mean, literally. Now, that doesn't mean people are eating high on the hog because who wants to eat, you know, those foods? But the point of the matter is that um, we took what was allotted, the ration that was allotted, and you did what you had to do to make it stretch. Sometimes you were in the field from sun up to sundown, depending upon the type of slave plantation you were on, right? Were you working on a task system? or were you working in a different type of system where you, didn't, you weren't able to go back home all day. That's why bringing to the new world the method of cooking in a one pot, where you put everything in one pot and it's stewed all day long, that's how come our collard greens sometimes are cooked all the way down, because you know, you stewed it all day long. Red beans and rice, right? You know, that was a Monday thing. While women were out washing, they were cooking, had their red beans on. Right? So we have to be familiar with our, our, our culture. So I try to be very clear in this new work um, about the, the myriad ways that African American people um, survived. I read a, an article not recently um, that I hadn't even thought about this, but when people escaped, often they got caught because they were hungry. Right? Be, because if you didn't plan to escape and make your provisions, and you had nothing to trap or, 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 or catch food, um, yeah, then that, that would be your peril. So these are some of the things, I mean, there's so much to know, and, and I think that, again, that's why I start with the single story, because I want to inform people that this is not going to be that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Um, another project that I'm working on is uh, underground economies, uh, or off the books, and and working uh, or in the illegal uh, economies. Absolutely. Um, in an article that I have written, at a, as I was sharing uh, with the group earlier, called "Other Women Cook for My Husband." Um, uh, there was a woman who my ex-husband and I used to go visit 
and he called her the Wache lady. He was from Ghana, West Africa. And uh, he would uh, get out of the car, go in, and come back with a styrofoam container. And it had basically uh, rice and sauce, fish, um, plantain, and so forth. This was a woman who was cooking out of her home, right? And um, every Friday, for the most part, that's what we ate. Yeah, absolutely. She probably um, could not uh, get a work permit uh, or anything. So yeah, a lot of underground economies today uh, exist around food, especially, I, I'm sure, he, everywhere, but certainly I know in the D.C., Maryland area, um, there are just restaurants in people's homes. You know, they only, they take reservations, and you have to be in the know to know. Um, and so, yes, absolutely, these hawkers are, are the historical to the precedent that we have today of working off the books in food industries. Does is, is that answer what you were? Yeah. Uh-huh, great. Other questions? You had a, yeah, Jimmy. Uh -huh. My questions are uh, myself one. Um, <laughs> you, you, you mentioned that, uh, uh, or you applied to talk that food policing is often taking place in the current diaspora of people out of New Orleans and other parts of the country. I wonder if you could say a bit more about the points of pressure of uh, food policing. What are the sort of primary means uh, or um, uh, forms of media in which food policing takes place? Right. Uh, how is that sort of a hegemonic culture? Uh, how does it diffuse outwards? How is it uh, experienced by people who are part of the diaspora? What forms of resistance are there to to that um, essentially hegemonic culture and food policing today? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take the piece of how food policing takes place. When I was uh, I I was giving a talk at a small Midwestern uh, College, and I, I gave a similar talk, but not this one. Um, and the next day, uh, my colleague came to me and said, we had um, several students who came to us and said they had not eaten their cultural food ways. This was a, a, an Asian uh, woman. She had not eaten her cultural food ways because it contained chicken. And they were told when they got to the campus, that you, you didn't eat chicken. Everyone there ate a microbiotic diet, brown rice, leafy vegetables, things of this nature. So she was like, for three years, she and her sister had not eaten their cultural foods. And so she said, you know, thank you for giving us permission to feel okay. I'm like, gosh, yeah. Uh, thank you for giving us permission to feel okay about those foods. Another woman, same college, this was completely by coincidence, she said, um, I'm from New Orleans, and we eat a lot of starch. But when I got here, they said, you know, everyone eats salads and brown rice. And so she's like, I don't, I don't let anyone know that I eat, you know, white rice almost every meal. So that's one way. It's, it's communally, right? It's communal. Another way is from the likes of people, quite frankly, uh, like Michael Pollan, who tells us we should all eat like our grandparents ate. Uh, you know, um, quite honestly, many of us can't eat like our grandparents ate or don't want to eat like our grand. But, but that's, he's, he's a noted uh, voice in the food world, and so folks uh, tend to follow him. I, we had another speaker come to the University of Maryland uh, who wrote a book um, as a journalist. And the number of people who stood up, and I was very surprised by this, mostly African-American women, and gave testimonials to how the book changed their lives. They literally, one woman said, I used to drink strawberry milkshakes all the time, but your book had me so convicted, I stopped eating strawberries completely, right? And the more testimonials that happened, you could see him like squirming, and he said, you know, these are some extreme examples. I, I never expected that when I wrote the book. So here these folks are. And, and that's good, if they felt, but they have run with this edict, and that was never his intention. Um, and so I think a lot of this is from public discourse. Um, as I said to you all earlier, when we say to people, I see it all the time on Facebook, I'm eating clean. And I always say to myself, well, do I eat dirty? Because I'm not, you know, what does that mean? I mean, am I a bad person because I'm not eating? You know, so I also think, as I shared with you all, we have to be careful about language. 
you know, and the ways that which we unintentionally indict people. I had a young woman who raised her hand, and I, I again shared this example, and she said, you know, how do we stop, get people to stop eating at McDonald's? Or how do we stop uh, people from eating here or there? And, and again, I will share with the larger audience, I said, why is that a concern of yours to stop this person from doing that thing? There's so many factors in our lives that influence how we engage food that when we, as a culture, we naturally, we, we all are informed by sound bites. CNN, Headline News, Fox News, everything is a sound bite. You know, AOL, Yahoo, what, we just get the little bit and many of us don't go farther to click on the link and then many of us don't go farther to read the entire piece and then we just stop at what we've been told. But that is part of the single story, <laughs> right? That's why I start with the DJ, because that is part of the narrative that this is, we gather sound bites along the way and that's what it is. That's how we come to all black people ate scraps. I mean, I had a, a, a good friend of mine tell me, you know, after he, we and I were talking about something, and he said at the end, you just, here, here's another one to tell me, you forgot one thing. And he was like, you know, we, we come from scraps. And I was, yeah, no, you know, that's not the story. That is just not, you know, let's not do that and not say that we did. And so, you know, the corrective is, is hard. It's hard. Um, I'm not suggesting that there are not health implications, but I think that advice needs to come from people's doctors, um, those who have studied in those ways. And even then, sometimes you have to question the doctor. I went to the doctor a while back, and she you know, took my blood pressure, and she was like, oh my God, your blood pressure is so high. I was like, really? I've never had high blood pressure. I said, wait, maybe should you change the cuff? Because the cuff is small, and my arm is a little bigger than the cuff. When she put it on, oh, okay, now it's not. See, so sometimes because of our experiences, right, we know our bodies, um, and we know our health as well, and so we might have to question authorities, and we're taught not to question authority. Yeah. So those would be some of the ways that I'd say I see those hegemonies at work in public discourse, in communities, through the media, even through our medical establishment. Other questions? Going once, twice? Okay, one more, okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a great question. Social justice without policing. Um, so in some communities, one way is, okay, so for, I was in uh, Illinois a couple years ago, and there was, on the cusp of the African American community, there was a small organic market. And uh, we went in, and um, I noticed the shelves were kind of bare, and you know, a few bananas here and there. And so she said, um, you know, they sort of told her who I was and the food work that I do. And she said, you know, I cannot get the black community to come here. You know, I just, I don't know why. We're here, we're providing these foods. We have, you know, we'll take SNAP, we'll do this, we'll do that. And everything about the conversation was about them coming to her. And I said, have you gone to any churches? across the street? Have you taken these foods over there and shown them what you have? Or are you waiting for them to come to you? That's the difference between policing and regulating and advocating. Go where they are, right? As opposed to them coming to you. You want their business, right? Uh, you want them to eat healthy is what she was saying. Um, so then why wouldn't you take your advocacy into the community? And why wouldn't you have what the community eats. Where are your sweet potatoes? Where are your greens, your kale, your poke salad, your poke weed, what have you? Where, are you, you know, your neck bones or your smoked turkey necks or what have you? Where are those things? And so often I, I, I hear this story about they just won't do it. And the question becomes, how do you advocate? How do you help people feel empowered? 
How do you help people feel like their life ways is important and that you understand and respect that? So is that, that works? Okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much.